back. Frankie, uh, I think you came up with this concept a while ago that we have on a Democrat or Republican, you know, I throw out the topics, we mix up a drink, they mix it up it on the been. topics, something, been. something like that. And one of our drunken strategy sessions, we came up with this crazy idea to have a Democrat and a Republican. And I think the first two guys we had in to do it, uh, pretty much, were uh, Eisenbach and uh, Burnett. David Eisenbach, a Columbia professor and uh, former Democratic candidate for public advocate. And John Burnett, managing director of uh, One Empire Group, columnist for Newsmax, a former Republican candidate for New York City controller. These guys mix it up with the best of them. Even though uh, Eisenbach is a, uh, is a Democrat, he always knows a way to my heart by wearing a Met hat. You know what I mean? So that, that's, that's near and dear to me. What's up, guys? Is, How are you? In his, in his mysterious cup. <laughs> yeah, well, all right. We can't see the mystery cup today, but... Uh, so, uh, guys, let's, let's kick this off. It's so crazy. We were talking a little earlier about, you know, all the things that are happening in, in the cancel culture, and really the ignition of that was, you know, George Floyd's death and then Antifa kind of hijacking the peaceful protests. Um, and now, um, yesterday, Trump signs this executive order outlining, you know, incentives for police reform. And I said to Frank yesterday, there's nothing he can say that anyone will compliment him on. John, let me ask you first, um, do these reforms in any way, you know, pass muster with, with the Black Lives Matter Antifa crowd? I don't know if anything can. However, this is really about... Uh, trying to find middle ground, and I think from a from a national federal level, uh, the certifications that's on their checklist uh, with respect to banning the chokehold, uh, that's on their checklist. In terms of hey, you know, they should be excited about the federal government uh, stepping in and encouraging uh, states and local municipalities to provide social services on many of these calls that involve. Uh, uh, that don't involve crimes, but might entail, um, let's say, mental health issues or some other like homeless issues or things of that nature. So that way the police aren't there trying to be counselors. They have those type of professionals with them on those type of calls. So I think that's that's tremendously important. And I think that uh, that also serves as, again, a middle ground for us to further our discussions. And I think, you know, creating a, a national uh, database with respect to officers that move around, uh, whether move around within their local uh, uh, locale, I should say, or move, let's say, from a police department to the FBI or so forth, that their record travels with them. Those are those are things at the federal level that the federal uh, government can do. The rest of the stuff needs to be handled at the state level in terms of the granular details. Damn. One thing that I found interesting is that the, the push for police reform uh, is nothing new. And it's been led not by the establishment of either party, but by, on the right, the libertarians and on the left. And it's this coalition of the libertarians with uh, members of the left. Uh, they're actually pushing this issue forward. Uh, so the establishment is kind of waking up to what both sides of the political uh, uh, persuasion have been screaming about for years. Yeah, so um, let's take that uh, one step further now. Um, many on the left are saying that Trump's executive order doesn't get there. It doesn't get them exactly everything they wanted. Um, now the Democrats are going to come out with some competing demands. Does this contribute to, uh, you know, an overall impasse? I think we're going to find our way. Uh, and by the way, there are many libertarians who are not satisfied with, uh, with Trump's uh, uh, executive order. So uh, I think that we can find a way with this bipartisan, anti-establishment coalition of libertarians and the left getting together. And by the way, if we can do this uh, with police reform, another issue that we all uh, agree on, the libertarian left and the uh, libertarian right and the left, uh, is Wall Street reform, uh, uh, the military industrial complex, the deep state. Uh, there are lots of issues uh, that we can all work together to, for common goals. I, I think I think we're on our way. The thing is, is that um, when you hear certain senators on the right and left, they say that they agree on 70 percent of what the police reform bill should entail. That's a higher percentage than any other 
average piece of legislation. So the fact that they're starting off, right, with more than two thirds agreement, I think I think the remaining portion, they'll work through those details, try to find a balance. There'll be some give and take. And I think we'll arrive at a national solution that the states and local municipalities can actually uh, work on and, and get the right training and resources applied to it. And by the way, we've done this before with prison reform, right? Uh, this is something that, again, the Democrat and Republican establishments refuse to do, but were pushed there uh, by the left and the libertarians uh, in both their parties. Uh, this is possible. And like you said, right, in this era of hyperpartisanship, police reform, prison reform, this seems to bring us all together. And let's be honest, it's really probably only one or two, one or two things that might be a, a sticking point and create an impasse that they'll, that they'll figure out a way to move past. Uh, one of them is the qualified uh, immunity. I think, I think there needs, that needs to actually be looked at from both perspectives. I understand the left, but if, if a person can be, can lose everything that they own personally, who would step up and take that job? That's there's right. no, that that's that's lunacy, right? So 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 let's create all these other reforms, uh, properly staff it with additional resources and so forth, instead of going to the maximum extreme. Yes, and and I urge the people on the left who who disagree with that point to just think about what it would be like to be sued, right, groundlessly. But you have to provide your own defense that will bankrupt you. Even if you're right, even if you are completely innocent, you can get bankrupted uh, with a lawsuit. Uh, so, so please, we, we have to protect good cops. David, um, if you were advising Joe Biden right now, who would you say is his best bet in terms of a vice presidential running mate? Uh, oh man, this is tough. This is tough. Uh, I think that that right now. Uh, he's definitely leaning uh, uh, towards Kamala Harris or Susan Rice. Um, of obviously, Susan Rice has uh, much more experience on the foreign policy front, but has never been elected to office. I tend to go with somebody who's been on the campaign trail, who's been tested out there, uh, who's been vetted to a great extent. Uh, I would go with Kamala. How about you, John? P uh, put on your Democratic consultant hat for a second to cover that bald spot. Who would you advise Joe Biden to pick if he had <laughs> recruited you as a consultant? I, I completely disagree with David. Um, and, and, that, and, that, and, and here's why. There's one thing to be a great camp camp campaigner, but can you do the job? That's like saying, you know what? She, he or she is great at interviewing, right? But overlooking, can they do the job? This should be about a person that has the experience. So who would your recommendation be? One. Who would your recommendation be? Let's say Joe Biden called you up. He says, I'm giving you half a million dollars to head my vice presidential search committee. You're in charge. We're going with your pick. Who would your recommendation be? I'm not doing anything less than a million dollars. No, but, but, but seriously. <laughs> uh, I'd, say, I'd say I'd look at the slate. I start reducing those that don't have experience and not elected um, or not even appointed. Uh, I think Susan Rice, uh, while I might disagree from the Republican perspective, but putting on that Democratic hat, she has foreign, ex foreign uh, relations experience. Um, she knows the inner workings of government, not just passing bills. This is not about passing bills. No, she's this quite the, um, she's quite the, um, she's a great unmasker. Also, if we're trying to get over this pandemic, we need somebody who knows how to unmask. Right. Oh, oh, also good at passing the buck. As to the Toronto, aisle, right? Toronto, uh, will tell you. Uh, so, John, your pick is Susan Rice, and David, your pick uh, would be Kamala Harris. Gun to your head. Because, because she's tested on the campaign trail, and the A number one uh, rule of picking a vice president is do no harm. Mm. Uh, there are, she's been vetted. That's the most important thing. Yep, but, but, but you know, Kamala Harris, guarantee you, if he picks her, being a prosecutor and then the author of the 94 crime bill, that's going to keep a lot of blacks, black votes at home. So the Republican side of me is like, yes, Harris, Harris, Harris. Yeah, right. We're rooting. And by the way, she also was the first one to launch a strike at him in the first debate about her being the little black girl that got took the bus. So, you know, they got some I, I don't think she's the pick, but uh, 
You guys are my pick for the most solid, consistent, best guest we have uh, all the time. I mean, can we ever get these guys separate, or are they like a ta- are they a package deal with their? No, it's in our contract. <laughs> together. <laughs> all right, we gotta get, we gotta leave it there. David Eisenbach and Johnny Burnett, thank you so much for joining us to mix it up. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us throughout this hour. But do not go anywhere. We're gonna come back and cover the news of the day right after this. <laughs> 